Right, this isn't a video that I could really do any filming for, so while I yabber on, I'm just going to play some B-roll that I took for the Bullet 500 review that I did a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I know that it's not really relevant to the subject, but this is a video. I have to play something while I'm talking. And as this is the sixth video on this subject, I figured you're probably fed up of seeing the same old footage from the Norton stand that I filmed last year at the NEC. I know I certainly am. Now, the original video that I did about the demise of Norton was just intended to be a one-off, but the story just grew and grew as time went on. Stuart Garner, a man who's normally very chatty in public, went extremely quiet. He disappeared into the woodwork, and to that extent, the story grew bigger than it might have done. Because if the man that has all the knowledge of what's gone on doesn't stand up and talk about what's gone on, People tend to get out their shovels and start digging. And when they start digging, they start digging up things that possibly wouldn't have come to light if he'd just spoken in the first place. A fairly typical, but in my opinion, gross miscalculation on Stuart Garner's part. Now, obviously we've had this whole pandemic thing which has sort of diverted attention away from the whole Norton fiasco. But throughout the pandemic, I've received regular comments, I don't know how many, but there's been a lot of them, for people asking what the latest update is on Norton and TVS, and what the latest update is on Mr. Garner. In actual fact, there hasn't been an awful lot going on. There's been more or less radio silence up until the last few days. So I thought today would be a good opportunity to just deal with, you know, that little bit of information that has recently emerged. Now, with my professional dealings with criminals, lots of criminals in a previous career, you start to recognise certain personality traits in certain types of people. Now, when you use the name psychopath, you tend to think of serial killers. People that are at the extreme end of the spectrum of psychopathy. But in actual fact, psychopaths are far more common than you would think. They come in all different flavours, covering a very broad spectrum from the harmless to the downright dangerous. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a psychopath. Some of the world's most innovative and successful personalities have shown psychopathic traits. Because psychopathy, if you like, frees a person up. It allows them to think outside of the box of normal convention. Because they're not bound by the same constraints that, if you like, normal people are bound by, psychopaths are usually characterised by someone who has a persistent antisocial behaviour trait. They don't care about other people, their empathy is switched off or impaired. And when they take action which adversely affects others, they have no remorse no regret. This, in a way, frees up their behaviour. They become disinhibited and capable of acting in quite extreme ways that normal people would never consider. And this is usually accompanied by narcissistic and egotistical characteristics. Does that sound like anyone we know? As I've said, psychopathy can be the secret to success. If it's partnered up with a high degree of intelligence and education, with a well-honed skill set that's applicable to the business or vocation that that person's chosen, it can reap dividends. Many hugely successful multinational corporations are headed by CEOs that display psychopathic traits. People whose ruthlessness and drive drive them to the top until they reach that fine line of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and for the most part manage not to step over it. Stuart Garner is not one of those people. Now I'm not saying that he's an unintelligent man but historically by his own admission is not an educated man. And by his own admission in early life, both at school and work, he was a failure. Now, it reached a point where he realised that life was just leaving him behind. He's a lazy man, so going back to education to hone his skills and knowledge wasn't an option. So, in some respects, he followed the same path as Edward Theodore Bundy. 
he honed his networking skills. He ingratiated himself with the right sort of people. He deceived and learned to manipulate until he eventually, again by deceit and manipulation, despite leaving a trail of devastated and bankrupt businesses behind him, acquired ownership of Norton. Now this is just my own opinion, but as this story has unfolded, I started to suspect that there was a psychopath at play in Stuart Garner's personality. With an abysmal business record, he'd managed to convince the British government to give him millions of pounds of the taxpayers' money, to be spent on a business model which when you look at it now was just so obviously doomed to failure. He persuaded banks and private investors to do the same. And during all this time, not motorcycles well, didn't really produce much in the way of motorcycles. But Garner's manipulated connections and his portrayal as a captain of industry leading a playboy-like lifestyle facilitated him to be able to take even more money from customers who were ordering bikes that were never going to be built and hard-working people investing their savings, their pensions into a scheme that was basically just paying for his lifestyle. Now, Garner has very recently broken his silence. If you remember me telling you in a previous video, he refused to turn up for a hearing by the financial ombudsman over the missing £14 million pension investments. Basically, he just didn't want to sit there and answer questions about what he'd done with £14 million worth of other people's money. And I'm not quite sure what he thought his refusal to attend would achieve. Maybe his ego thought that without him it just wouldn't be able to go ahead, I don't know. But eventually it did go ahead and a judgement was made against him. And I think that this is possibly the first time in Ghana's life that someone in an official capacity has stood up and publicly proclaimed a judgment on him. Now, to my mind, the Ombudsman was very diplomatic in the way that he projected his findings, but they were nevertheless damning. And this will have been a major blow to someone like Garner's ego. And I think that's what's caused him to come out of the woodwork and speak. Now, the Ombudsman ruled that Garner had acted dishonestly in relation to his administration of these three pension schemes. And there was mention of him consorting with known criminals in relation to that administration. It was ruled that he had breached his statutory investment and trust law duties towards the investors. He was accused of gross maladministration and it was pointed out that Garner lacked the education and necessary knowledge required to run such schemes. It was a short statement but I think it very much summed up Stuart Garner's life and the way he generally conducts himself. It's hit a nerve and smashed his ego. Because I think in his mind, the things that that ombudsman said were things that he thought were secret, that no one else knew. It's shattered the illusion of his personality that he has betrayed to the world for the past decade or so. And so he decided to make a statement. Now, looking at it, it would have been better for him if he hadn't. Because it's quite revealing, and in a way I'm surprised no one else has really picked up on it. Now, from the kickoff, he refused to comment on the Ombudsman's findings, which is not surprising, because for his personality type, it is just not on to sit there and talk about your own faults and failings. There's no legal reason that I can see for avoiding discussing what the Ombudsman said because his findings are public. I think it's more a case of his ego not permitting him to discuss it because it's too painful. Now, it goes on to say that he's working with BDO, who are the Norton administrators, and that BDO are sitting on £16 million, which is obviously the £16 million that were the proceeds of the sale of Norton to TVS. Now, what he seems to be saying there is that He's cooperated fully, and he's sort of pushing the blame over to BDO that people haven't been paid because they're sitting on all this money. So it's not his fault. 
It goes on to say that several million more pounds are expected to come in from the sale of assets. By this, he means property at Donington Hall, the Norton factory, because TVS don't own that. I'll get onto that in a minute. A hotel and, I believe, a caravan park, which were all purchased using other people's money. Now, we don't know exactly how much money the sale of these properties is going to make, but he sort of intimated that the proceeds from these sales were going to pay those pensioners back. Because he went on to say, and I quote, the money is not missing, it's all tied up in business and assets. It's that sentence that sealed the deal for me as to my opinion of his psychology. I'm sure he thought that was a really clever statement, but it just serves to demonstrate, for me anyway, that he has an overinflated estimation of his own intelligence and underestimates everyone else's intelligence because of course that money is missing when those schemes came to term and he was expected to pay that money back he didn't have it when those people asked for their money back he didn't answer them and they didn't get it because he didn't have it it had been spent it was missing trying to substitute the existence of other assets that may or may not repay that money in lieu of payment is not the same thing as having their money. That money is missing. It is, to my mind, a ludicrous statement to make. Now, he went on to discuss his future, which didn't really amount to much. But what he did say, and again, for me, this is reverting to type, is that he'd lost everything. Playing the victim, playing for sympathy after everything that is done. And what is more notable is what he didn't say. Bearing in mind the definitions of psychopathy that I relayed to you earlier on, he expressed no sympathy or remorse to those pensioners whose savings he took and didn't give back. He didn't even make anything approaching any kind of apology, displaying a total lack of empathy and remorse. I look back at all the various articles and interviews that Garner's done over the last decade in various magazines and publications where he portrays himself as a sort of a rough diamond, a sort of an autobiography of a Jack the Lad, a lovable rogue that made good. Of course, the true facts about Garner's personality weren't known then. And when you look back at it and put the pieces of all those articles together, it reads more like the autobiography of a psychopath to me. Right, and finally, on to TVS. Now, £16 million they paid for Norton Motorcycles. Not exactly just pocket change, and you would have expected that they got something tangible for that kind of money. It now transpires that that £16 million paid for the Norton name, and the intellectual property that goes with that, including the Atlas and the V4 models, and presumably some machinery and manufacturing equipment. But that's it, there were no bricks and mortar included in that price. Now, in a way, I suppose the pandemic has been a blessing in disguise for Norton because it's given them several months to sit back and formulate some sort of plan as to the way ahead. Presumably, they will have been able to furlough the current staff that work there, so currently they will have been under no pressure. Now, John Russell, Norton's current interim CEO, has recently divulged that TVS Norton only took out a short-term lease on the current Norton factory, with a view to moving and expanding premises in the near future. Now, it's early days and there's been no indication given as to where Norton will relocate to. I know we would all like to believe that it's going to be somewhere in the UK, but in reality, I'm not sure how much sense that would make. Taking as an example the Atlas models under the old ownership of Norton, the retail price was projected to be around about the £12,000 mark. Now that is a lot of money for a 650cc bike. And even if they managed to cut the expenses down somewhat, get it into mass production and reduce the price to nine or 10000 
it's still not going to be competitive. It would appear that once this lease runs out, TVS Norton are at liberty to take the manufacture of these bikes anywhere they like. I know that they pledged to keep the UK workers on, and that is exactly what they've done, but they didn't say how long that was going to remain the case. And I might be wrong, but it does appear that the most likely site for manufacture of these bikes in the future, if it goes ahead, is going to be India. I think this model is going to be greatly watered down compared to the original iteration that we saw. And that combined with Indian labour costs for their domestic market with no import duties to pay could place this model to be built as a direct competitor to the likes of the Royal Enfield Interceptor. It also means that the export market, in particular us in the UK, could see that bike on the showroom floor for half the original projected retail price. I think as far as Norton TVS are concerned at the moment, it's still all to play for. All we can do is sit back and wait and see what happens. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video and in doing so helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate your time. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you do subscribe, don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you can be informed whenever I upload a new video. I will, of course, be back next week, so until then, ride safely, and I'll see you soon.